This video is sponsored by Noom. I recently launched my new Day Something Was Born series with Parks and Recreation. The concept of the series is to take a look at a beloved series with troubled or flawed beginnings and pinpoint the moment the series hit its creative stride. Thankfully, the first entry covering Parks and Rec was received really well, and a lot of people out there suggested I use the same concept with It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I was immediately intrigued. Not only because It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia is one of my favorite TV shows, but because I think unlike Parks and Recreation, It's Always Sunny was fantastic from the very first episode, with so many defining elements of the show already in place. But the show did change in the first few seasons, molding into the delightfully shocking and hilarious show we've all known and loved for the past 14 seasons and counting. So, which elements were already in place from the beginning? What changed in the first few seasons? And what is... It's Always Sunny had a very unique origin story compared to other TV shows. This wasn't a show born from a network, or a studio, or an agency. It came from three out-of-work actor friends in Los Angeles. Rob McElhenney, Glenn Howerton, and Charlie Day. Struggling to find work and hoping to make something for cheap that they could share with their friends, McElhenney wrote ten pages of a simple scene between two friends. I was laying in bed one night, and uh, I was just thinking of, of an exchange between two people in which one tells another that he's uh, dying of cancer and the other one's reaction is to get out of the room as, as fast as possible. No, it's I found out that I might have cancer. <laughs> what? It's just this guy trying to wriggle out of listening to his friend tell him about how he has cancer. It started out like this. I wasn't feeling well. Oh, oh I'm, did you, did you, did you want to talk right now? That's the cornerstone of the whole show to me. It shows what kind of people the, they are. And that scene would perfectly establish the characters and tone of the world that would become It's Always Sunny. And not only do you know who these people are, but you know the tone of the show, you know the world that you're setting up. And we just thought, well, you never see this kind of thing in TV. They ended up making an entire pilot episode, filming it themselves in their own apartments with other actor friends on a budget of about $200 just enough to cover the cost of the tapes they filmed with. It was a guerrilla-style short film that was McElhenney's last-ditch effort to secure an acting career, made without any considerations for network restrictions or FCC approval, that he then took to various networks as a proof of concept for a show about a group of selfish, despicable friends struggling to make it as actors in Los Angeles. Executives at FX loved the pilot, but wanted to make a few changes. They felt that there were already enough shows about struggling actors in Hollywood and asked if they'd be willing to change the setting, which led to the show being set in Philadelphia, McElhenney's hometown, and also changed their professions from struggling actors to owners of a bar, Patty's Pub. Now, the fact that they were actors had nothing to do with the story because it was all about how they're just scumbags and they get over on each other. Um, we could take that whole element out of it. We could put scumbags in anywhere we wanted to. We can put these guys right in Philadelphia. All we need to do is give them a job that they have lots of time on their hands like actors do, uh, that they have their days free to, uh, to screw their lives up. The only thing McElhenney wouldn't budge on, if the series did get picked up, was that he, Howerton, and Day would serve as writers, producers, and act in the starring roles. Based on the strength of the pilot and the low budget involved, FX ordered a seven-episode first season that premiered on August 4th, 2005 with the episode The Gang Gets Racist. Even from the show's pilot episode, you can see a lot of elements that would remain integral to the rest of the series. Dennis's vanity, Charlie's unhealthy obsession with the waitress, schemes to get over on each other, the instantly recognizable music by German composer Heinz Kiesling, which were originally chosen not just because of the tongue-in-cheek dichotomy of the music paired with the crude subject matter, but because the songs were in the public domain and thus free to use. The home movie aesthetic of the unaired pilot, with its heavy dialogue and minimal locations and cast, is felt throughout the first season, because it was made for considerably less money than other cable shows at the time. The fact that the main cast were also writers and good friends helped give the show instant chemistry that would normally take multiple seasons to build organically. Another element that was there from the very beginning was the biting satire of potentially risky and offensive topics. In the pilot episode, they touch on racism and homosexuality. Boys are out tonight, huh? 
but throughout the rest of the season, they also touch on abortion, underage drinking, cancer, transsexuals, gun violence, and child molestation. A show about selfish people commenting on topics that are normally considered off-limits is exactly what made this show the anti-sitcom, or Seinfeld on crack, which is how it was branded early on. As creatively strong as the first season was, there were still a few issues that the show needed to fix moving forward. Hey, 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 hey! Give me some eyes! Look at me! Cool your jets! One of those was the development of the main characters. In the beginning, there were no discernible differences between any of them. They were all kind of your everyman characters, equally clever, far from the characters they would become with heightened versions of their strangest and goofiest traits. And the character that needed the most work from the original gang was Sweet D. McElhenney openly admitted that the writers struggled with her character at the beginning, and I'm sure that's for a number of reasons. When they were making the unaired pilot, the character of Sweet D was played by McElhenney's then girlfriend, Jordan Reed. But when they broke up, they recast her part with Caitlin Olsen. The chemistry that came instantly with the men on the show, because of their real life friendships, took longer to form with Olsen. And the idea for Dee's character changed over time too. Her dynamic in the gang was initially supposed to be the sensible, straight woman character, eye rolling and trying to foil the guy's plans. But Olsen didn't want to be regulated to the sidelines as the boring voice of reason character, and so she almost quit the show entirely. I said, with all due respect, I just don't want to play that character. I don't want to be the voice of reason. It just wasn't what I was interested in doing. They said to me, look, we just haven't really written for women that much, but we'll figure it out. My first thought was, well, don't write for a woman. Just write another funny character. I'll make it female just by doing anything. I just am a woman. Don't think about it as male or female. Some of my favorite D moments are very masculine things, though. They're very traditionally masculine things. I don't know. I find that funny. There aren't a lot of highlights of Dee's character in the first season. The most opportunities she had to display her comedic talents came in what's probably my favorite episode of the first season, Underage Drinking, A National Concern. Take it slow. Take it slow. I know you guys, but I just am so nervous. I just want this whole night to be so special. But there's definitely a noticeable shift in her character's development in the second season, with episodes like Dennis and Dee go on welfare. I'm a recovering crackhead. This is my retarded sister that I take care of. I'd like some welfare, please. And Hundred Dollar Baby. You look like a Holocaust victim in pageant makeup. I will eat your babies, bitch! <laughs> her character wasn't shoved to the sidelines anymore, but became more integral to the storylines and got to show off her own depravity. The other issue that needed to be fixed from the first season was the poor ratings. Even though that was really out of their own control, since FX was a relatively new channel, aired new episodes at a terrible time slot in the evening, and didn't want to spend any money to promote it. Uh, we had only been on the air, uh, I think we only aired seven episodes. Okay. They aired the show on like a Wednesday night around 10.30. Um, and they didn't promote it in any way. And I got a call from John Langreff, who runs the studio. Mr. Still in the FX, studio. Oh, yeah, yeah, the best. Yeah. Well, nobody watched the show. <laughs> and I said, well, you didn't market it, John. Yeah, okay. and he said, uh, well, you know, here's the thing. We're going to pick you up for season two. Well, here's the thing. We don't have a marketing budget. But what we'd like to do is bring on an actor uh, of some... Uh, of some note that has a little cachet, somebody that can bring some exposure to the show. Uh, and he said, what, what do you think about Danny DeVito? And I said, we love Danny DeVito, but we don't want him on the show. Uh, I, we don't want Danny DeVito. And he said, why? <laughs> why? And I said, look, it's nothing personal against Danny DeVito. I grew up watching Danny. You don't know if it's going to screw the dynamic, you know, of the, of the chemistry of the show. Right. We thought we had something really special. And uh, we really thought that maybe bringing a movie star on would ruin the chemistry. And uh, he said, great, well, then you don't have a show. And we were like, okay, get Danny DeVito on the phone as quickly as possible. The only thing more important than chemistry on a TV show is the TV show. Sure. Frank Reynolds was introduced in the second season premiere, Charlie Gets Crippled, and definitely affected the dynamic. In many ways, his character felt like D's in the first season struggling to find his place in the group. He felt like another obstacle that interrupted the gang's plans and schemes, almost like a nuisance, which is how Dennis and Dee saw him at first, too. He needed time to immerse himself in the show, but that was difficult in the second season because of his incredibly tight schedule. He was only allowed 20 shooting days to film the entire season, 
meaning that the cast and the crew had to prep all 10 episodes ahead of time to get all of Danny's scenes in the front of the schedule. The growth and change that happens to a character organically over a season was rushed, which slowed that process down. And while we see many of the aspects of Frank Reynolds there in the second season, the unethical businessman, his affinity for guns, the manipulation and horrible parenting instincts, he still primarily felt like Dee's character in the first season, the outsider, the lone voice of reason. But again, like Dee's character, as he became more depraved like the others and involved in the storylines, he gelled more and more with the group's dynamic. To DeVito's credit, he immediately understood the tone of the show, its unique humor, and what he could bring to the table as the father figure to this twisted gang of despicable people. And his role in the show's success cannot be understated. He's rightfully a fan favorite for many, with some of the greatest and weirdest moments in the entire series. Hey, what's up, bitches? I'm a man cheater. I just wanna be pure. That's my character. I'm the trash man. Whoa, whoops, oh. I dropped my monster condom that I used for my magnum dong. He adds yet another layer to the insanity with his own special brand of crazy that matches the rest of the gang and often exceeds it. And from a story perspective, his character was also able to provide bankroll to the group that allowed the schemes and plot points to get bigger and crazier while still remaining true and authentic to the story world. While his inclusion was never initially planned by the writers and essentially was a creative decision forced upon them by the network, it ended up being the best thing that could have possibly happened to the show. He fully embraced everything they were trying to do with the series and went along with every joke or gag, no matter how bizarre or potentially embarrassing, like the infamous couch gag in the Christmas special, A Very Sunny Christmas. So while I do believe that the first season is great, the show just doesn't feel the same in hindsight without Frank. By the third season, everything was falling into place creatively. The characters were all on their arcs of extremes and de-evolution, their dynamics were all working together, the mythology and cast of recurring characters was expanding. It felt like they were hitting their stride with each new episode. Like the gang finds a dumpster baby, the gang gets invincible, and Dennis and Dee's mom is dead. But for me, every element came together perfectly for the first time in the fourth episode, the gang gets held hostage. We're taking you bitches hostage. The show was getting bigger, going on more locations, the characters were splitting up more, but in The Gang Gets Held Hostage, they went back to their roots and what they do best. It was a stripped down bottle episode contained entirely inside Patty's pub. And that allowed them to rely on dialogue, character relationships, and bizarre situations. Some of the best episodes of the entire series are often when they're confined together inside Patty's pub. Like The Gang Dances Their Asses Off, The Gang Gets Quarantined, Charty McDennis, The Game of Games, Who Got Depregnant, Reynolds vs. Reynolds, The Serial Defense, The Gang Solves the Bathroom Problem, and Charlie Work. They use the space incredibly well. It caters itself to whatever the situation calls for. And it allows for the characters to rely on the fantastic dialogue the show has had since the unaired pilot. But the other element that's been with the show since its origins is the terrible way these so-called friends and family members treat each other. These characters are at their best when they're at their worst. It's arguably the most core ingredient to the show's success. I grew up watching Friends, yeah, and uh, always loved the show. And then when it was when we were thinking about shows that we wanted to make, I thought, well, they've already done that, so how can we do the opposite of that? Literally, in the theme song, it says, "I'll be there for you." What would be the opposite of that? What if you made a show where <laughs> you had characters who would never be there for any of their friends? Well, that would be an interesting show. I've never seen that before. Their general lack of compassion and empathy for everyone in their lives is what makes them who they are. We've seen them laugh at each other's drug addictions, abandon each other when being mugged, try to have sex with each other's moms out of spite. They're terrible people who will sell each other out at the first sign of trouble. And the premise of most episodes of the show is to have the group splitting down the middle, pitted against each other, and trying to win some argument or get revenge. But it's in The Gang Gets Held Hostage that we truly see how far they'll go to screw each other over. We need to watch out for each other, okay? The only way that we're gonna get through this is if we stick together. Nobody has to die. Somebody has to die. Immediately, they're backstabbing, manipulating, and picking sides. And here, it's not just about winning an argument or something petty. It's about getting someone else killed so they themselves can survive. 
I'd say it's like a game of chess, but they're all too stupid for that. It's more like a bunch of children playing checkers and knocking the board over in frustration. There are so many times throughout the episode where they betray someone and try to get someone else killed to save their own neck. You and I will form an alliance. We'll form an alliance. Dennis is gonna try and have you killed. Okay, should we kill him first or well, something? Look, I don't want anybody to have to die, but if somebody does, there's no reason it shouldn't be Dennis. It should be Dennis. Yeah. Forget about the rest of them, Frank. They're all gonna perish. It's just me. There's still time to save me. Get down here. You're gonna be on D's team? Some loyalty, bro. Away. Dude, what the hell, man? You don't wanna be on my dick team? Whatever happens, make sure Charlie's the first one to die. Get on your knees, bitches! What are you doing? Now you're on their side? I'm a McPoyle now, so you wouldn't kill me, right? No, no, she's got Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah, she'll listen to her, okay? Yeah. She'll betray you. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that won the immunity challenge. I'm the one that should live. It's in this episode that we see properly, for maybe the first time, that these characters aren't just jerks, but true sociopaths with absolutely zero moral limits. Damn it, Charlie. It feels like a turning point in the series, a new era, with all the characters in the format of the show becoming fully realized self-centered egomaniacs who will screw over everyone at a moment's notice, regardless of the situation. And what's great about this particular episode is that each of the five main characters plays a unique role in the madness, leaving none of them feeling underutilized or shoved to the side. Frank is in the vents searching for the will, Charlie escapes the McPoyles and goes after Frank to stop him, Mac tries to play both sides while also trying to save his life by wrecking the bar, Dennis tries to flirt his way to safety by seducing Margaret, and Dee gets Stockholm Syndrome and tries to join the McPoyles so she won't be killed. All the characters are using their own traits and skills in order to survive, while backstabbing each other every step of the way. The more they embraced the extreme elements and the absolute worst of each of these characters, both major and minor, the more the show felt like something all its own. Nowhere else could you see a live-action sitcom where a bunch of people were convinced that their friend is a serial killer, or opening a sweatshop, or a father pimping out his son to avoid being whacked by the mob, all of which take place in the third season as well. These were the exact reasons It's Always Sunny became so popular. It really felt like something you'd never seen from a live-action sitcom before. It didn't take long for It's Always Sunny to start gathering the massive audience it deserved, and now, after a $200 pilot, near cancellation, cast changes, a touring musical, a Christmas special, and a recent four-year renewal through season 18, it's now become the longest-running live-action sitcom in TV history. The blend of sharp writing, unique characters, and social satire has sustained the show over the years. And even though a lot of these elements were there from the very beginning, finding the exact creative formula for success took a little time. But was finally cemented on September 20th, 2007 in the episode The Gang Gets Held Hostage, the day It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia was born. Three, two, one, what up? The first alcoholic dairy-based protein drink for bodyguards. Bye, bodyguard! I drink it every morning so I can fight like the crowd. Fight me! Ah! Tired of diets that focus on quick fixes and miracle cures that are all flash and no substance, then you need to check out Noom. Noom is a health and wellness program that uses science and psychology to teach people how to live healthier lives. And the psychology aspect is what really stands out with Noom. It helps you learn how your mind works so you can develop habits that actually last. There's a subconscious process that controls every action you take. It's called the behavior chain. When you take the Break the Behavior Chain lesson, you'll find out your personal triggers and pitfalls, what's motivating them, and the actions you can take to put yourself in the best position to succeed. When you sign up with Noom, you'll also be partnered with a personal goal specialist who's trained in psychology, fitness, and nutrition, because what works for one person may not work for you. Click the link below so you can check out their website and take the quick and easy evaluation to find the plan that's customized for you and your personal needs. Thanks everyone for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this exploration into It's Always Sunny. If you did, please like it and share it with a friend. And also leave me a comment below. Tell me, when do you think It's Always Sunny was born? Make sure you're subscribed below and click the bell below. That's the only way to make sure that you won't miss a new video whenever it comes out. Right now, only 9.5% of my subscribers have clicked the bell. As a first step, let's get that up to 10%. That should be easy. 
Seriously, I can't tell you how many times people have reached out to me to tell me that YouTube isn't sharing my videos with them. So click the bell right now, so that way you don't have to rely on YouTube's algorithm. Thanks again everyone for watching, and I will see you all next time.